Tommy Case. I live in a historic community just west of Georgetown called uh, Great Crossings. I've been involved in um, fiddle making since 2002. I learned uh, what I am part of the trade that I know about from my mentor in uh, Franklin County. His name was Bill Huckabee. Uh, he uh, helped me through two violins uh, that I made under his close supervision. And then uh, as I worked on additional violins, me and another friend who worked together, his name is Lucian Parker, uh, he helped me or mentored me through other violins that I made as well. Um, I also took, uh, in uh, 2012 and 13, I took another apprenticeship uh, from Art Mize in Lexington. He is a uh, great luthier. He sells and restores uh, violins. Uh, just, he has a shop near Transylvania University. So uh, that is basically my formal education. And of course, I also uh, do a lot of research online yeah. and uh, try to keep up with the new practices. But that's my background in the making process. I tell you, when I was growing up in the 1970s, uh, Ricky Skaggs, who was uh, from Eastern Kentucky, from Lawrence County, um, he uh, played uh, bluegrass and started in the country music, and at that time he played the mandolin, and I thought, I've got to learn how to play the mandolin. That was when I was 40 years old. So uh, I started playing the mandolin, and then after that, I think it's a normal transition since the notes are the same with the mandolin, the fingering and so forth, that everybody wants to play the fiddle. And so that's when I got into playing the fiddle, which my wife regretted because I had to, to go in the bathroom to keep from driving all the family crazy. But you have to be hard-headed if you want to be a musician, especially a fiddle player. And so that's how I got started and interested in actually playing music. Well, one, one thing that my apprenticeship that I mentioned with Bill Huckabee, uh, Bill was at the end of his life when he took me and uh, two or three other people sort of under his wing. One guy, he made bows. And then the solution, Parker and I made fiddles together. Um, he, you know, I told him, I said, Bill, you know, uh, as I go through this, if I ever find a young person or persons that's really interested, you know, in learning how to make a violin and going through the basic steps that you have, you've, uh, you know, given me, I will make sure that I pass that on. And really that's, really drives me more than anything. And, um, you know, that was a sort of a promise that I made to him, you know, uh, toward the end of his life. And I always said, uh, making an instrument and putting your name inside of it, it's like, you know, throwing a, a bottle in the ocean. Usually people take care of instruments and at some time in the future, somebody will look inside and say, Tommy Case, I wonder who that fellow was in the research. So it's sort of a legacy to me to make instruments and have your name involved with them. Well, I think, you know, you, you see, I mean, most of the instruments that I have access to are trade instruments that were made in the early 1900s in Germany during the First World War. And there's so many of those out there. Almost everybody ends up with them. They think that they found a Stradivari and so forth because of the label in it, but it's really not an original you know, European instrument. Very few people, especially here in Kentucky, you know, actually run up on an original instrument. So, um, you know, when you make an instrument, uh, you know, each time you try to improve and you think, well, when I carve the belly or the top on this particular violin, I'm going to include a little bit more height in it to make a little bit more air volume. Hopefully it'll improve the tone. And that's what everybody's trying to do is trying to make an instrument that people will listen to, be interested in, and, and think that it sounds good. In, in, um, in the 1980s, as I mentioned before, I tried to learn how to play the mandolin. But once I started to get interested in the violin, I realized, you know, I had to have a teacher. You know, there weren't any frets. And it wasn't as easy to find, to follow the tablature as you do on a fretted instrument. So uh, uh, 
Wanda Barnett, who played with the Coon Creek Girls and performed at Renfro Valley down in uh, Southern Kentucky, down I-75. She was available in the Richmond area and I took uh, lessons from her for about six months. And then uh, I ran up on a fellow, you know, who was just a blessing or anybody that runs up against him. His name is Raymond McLean with the McLean family band. And Raymond's been through several transitions from playing with other bluegrass bands, playing with his family band. And now he was the director of traditional music at East Kentucky, East Tennessee uh, College. And then now he is the director of traditional music up at Moorhead. And so uh, Raymond is such a great person. He always tries to instill confidence in you know his students. And um, both of the teachers that I had were willing to take on adults. Like I say, I started when I was 40 or in my early 40s, uh, rather than just concentrating on kids that they knew they could really, really uh, mentor from an early start. I think it's easier to teach kids sometimes than it is adults because you have to adjust to skills and so forth. But both of those teachers were really great for me. And I know they've influenced not only me, but hundreds of people across Kentucky and in East Tennessee where Raymond taught for a while. Uh, wood selection, uh, there's a, there is a choice uh, for any maker. You can either use European wood or wood from North America. Uh, I follow along the pattern that Bill Huckabee had. We found a tone wood supplier out in the Western Rockies and uh, he provides big leaf maple and Sitka spruce or Engelman spruce. And so uh, I had a pretty good relationship with him and the wood was uh, economical enough. I would, since the shipping was extra, you know, I would buy it in lots that would last me for four or five years. So that's, that's, that's the wood selection uh, process. Um, as far as down the shop, when we go down there, uh, Bill, uh, he was an engineer at GE until his retirement. So he was really into making a lot of his tools and acquiring uh, things that really save time. And when we go down there, you'll see the templates that he had. He has a small lathe for turning down pegs. Uh, he has a graduation tool. When, once you make the violin plates, whether it's the front or the back, you have to scoop out the inside. You're basically making a drum. And he has a special device that he made to drill the graduation patterns so that when you're hollowing out the inside that you don't get lost or go through the wood because you're taking it down to two and a half millimeters, you know, in the center section. So when we go down there, the, that's what we'll see. And um, most of the work is done with chisels, scrapers, and uh, just basic tools. This is my ad hoc put together shop, but um, I have all the basic tools that I use, uh, you know, for uh, violin making. Uh, one of the unique things that I got from Bill Huckabee um, when he passed away, a friend of mine and I, we bought most of all of his tools. This is a drying cabinet. And once you start varnishing violins, you have to put 10 or 12 coats on. 
So this helps, it has black lights and fan, it helps dry the varnish through each step. So that's that piece. That's homemade, of course. This is a small lathe that we used, and you use this to turn down the pegs. Uh, the pegs, when they come, when you buy them, are larger, but um, this lets you turn them down to the actual size and fit them into the violin. This, of course, bandsaw drill, <laughs> drill press. This is another thing that I use a lot in this is a rotary sander that you can run material through and making the sides, especially for a violin, uh, the sides of a violin are one millimeter. So this allows you to sand that down uh, to that spe specification, you know, when you're bending the wood to make the sides of the violin. I'll show you one other piece in here. This is a piece, uh, as I mentioned, Bill Huckley, my first mentor, he worked for GE as an engineer uh, uh, up until his retirement to Franklin County, uh, Peaks Mill area. And this is a homemade piece that he made. I just think he saw a picture of it. But it allows you to drill the graduation pattern, you know, for a violin down all the way to 2.5 millimeters for the, uh, the top and the back. So it's real useful. You could do it with a drill press, but this is a lot handier and a lot more precise. And that's mainly, I, I might show you some of the other jigs that we have. This is a, a commercial cradle for a violin that when you're carving the inside or the outside, you can put the plate in here, the top or the back, carve the outside, then flip it over. You can see on the inside, it's been hollowed out. Or you can use this to carve out uh, the insides. Show you something else I use a lot. These may, may be unique that people don't know a lot about them, but these are thumb planes and they're small planes that are used for taking out material. It's sort of like a chisel, but it's made in a way that you can use the movie with your hand and do very precise carving, both carving the outside of the, the top and the back as well as the inside. So these, once I, I started using these, these are really, really great tools for a luthier. Uh, this is this is an instrument that we're working on. It has a uh, it has a two piece back. It's been seamed up the middle, but that's a classic violin style. And then of course it has a one piece top. Uh, the spruce was really tight grained and ran straight up and down, so we didn't have to make any adjustments or make a two piece top. This one has been carved both the outside. Uh, of the top and the back, of course, the sides bent and put together, and the F holes have been cut. The next step is to cut the joint that attaches the uh, uh, the neck to the instrument. That's the, that's the last step before actually setting it up, and so we're going to be working on that over the next two weeks to try to get to get this instrument to a point to where. You can set it up and play it in the white, and uh, um, that way you can see how it sounds and stuff before we actually varnish it. This is an example. This is the the mold that is used to bend the sides. The, I was talking about being able to sand it down to one millimeter to make the outside of the instrument. And this, this, this one has been uh, come to a point or as far as putting it together that you can see where the graduation pattern has been uh, uh, laid out on the inside. And now what's left is for both the back and the front of the instruments 
to actually take the the uh, material out. You can see these pattern. This is 3.3 millimeters around the outside, three millimeters here in the center, and 2.4 or 2.5, 2.6 millimeters. And so you're making a drum and you want it to vibrate, you want it to be light. And so that's uh, taking out the excess material on the inside. Both of these, the necks and the scrolls, been carved. Again, there's a lot of finishing work as far as getting everything uh, scraped down to the final dimensions and so forth before varnishing. But uh, pegs have been installed. Fingerboard's been installed um, and ready for installation once that part is finished and carving the top and the back. So that's the main main components and for these two instruments how far we've come to, the, to this point. Okay, when we talked about wood, uh, this gives you an idea. Most, most violins are made with quilted maple. I mean, the components for a guitar or a violin or a mandolin that they are made with hard wood for the the box or the the back and sides and neck of the instrument is made out of most of the time uh, quilted maple this instrument on on my other side here it, it is also out of maple but it's another cut, cut of the wood same wood but it's cut in a different way and this is called quilted maple. And when it's finished, uh, to me, it makes a really attractive pattern. It's like almost like a cloud uh, uh, pattern on the back of a violin. Wood's not quite as stable as the, as the uh, quilted and a little bit different, but it is unique and a lot of people like it. Because this one is a five string violin. It has a low C string and so it's tuned C, G, D, A, E. So that if you're a string teacher and you'd like to uh, have one instrument that you can teach both viola and violin, you can do that. Or if you're an advanced player and take advantage of the C string, a lot of bluegrass players, they use five strings and uh, it, it gives them another dimension in their playing, somebody that's a real expert. So I made uh, three of these. I sold one and I have two more. This one is probably the most unique. This thing is not something that I made up. It is called a Dance Master Violin. And uh, this one is a copy of one that was made by Stradivari. Uh, and the collector of this, his name was Clapperson. A lot of the historical vintage instruments were purchased by rich people that had the ability to keep these instruments and use them as an investment. I have to admit that the carved head on there, which is quite nice, but I purchased that and used it. I did not carve and I don't have the experts to do that. But these, these little instruments were carried made because they were easier to carry. They were called travel violin and they were carried from one household to the other by people that taught different dance steps. I think all the aristocratic folks had coming out parties and so forth for their their girls or, or their young men and they would go from one household to the other teaching different dances or folk dances. So this is a, a, a reproduction of one of those. I, I really do like the F hold. They're different than a conventional violin. These are Baroque or which comes from a period, a historical period of Baroque instruments that preceded uh, the modern violin design that was uh, brought into being by Stradivari and some of the other famous Guarneri, some of the other famous makers back in the 16, late 1600s and 1700s. Uh, evidently there was a fellow in Eastern Kentucky and he got crossways with his wife, wife and uh, in some fit of anger, uh, he murdered his wife. And of course, they caught him and took him down to the jail. And supposedly he was a fiddle player. And um, so during his time in jail, he the sheriff let him have his violin and he composed this tune. 
It's called Coleman's Wall, uh, uh, Coleman's March. And um, he, his intent was to play it on the way to the gallows. And uh, he did that. And he, he told the people, whoever, whoever can take my violin or take my fiddle and play this tune uh, and when we get out there, uh, I will give it to them. That will be my last uh, will and testament because uh, that's the last position that, uh, possession that I have. So this is uh, just a couple of times through Coleman's March. With you. <laughs> 